CBS reports. Some are more equal than others. The first in a series on justice in America with CBS correspondent Eric Severide. Most of us grew up in America with a school book image of justice in our minds. Justice was a woman, compassionate, noble. Her eyes were closed to our color, our accents, our finery, or our rags. She held those scales even. This image was always an ideal. Today it is closer to fantasy than reality. Consider, for every 10 serious crimes committed in this country, there's only one conviction. In nine out of 10 criminal convictions, there is no trial. Of every 10 persons behind the bars of local jails, five are innocent in the strict legal sense. It is the machinery of justice in America that is close to breakdown. Machinery can be repaired. The president says it must be repaired. In the course of these broadcasts, we will try to show you what is wrong with the central cog in the machine, the courts. Their terrible overcrowding, their inability to effectively cope with crime. What is wrong and how good men are trying to right it. But first tonight, what has happened to the fundamental concept of equality under the law? For years now, there has been a flood of public passion about the legal treatment of dissident and minority groups, Black Panthers, the Chicago Seven, the poor in general. What we will try to do is cut through the rhetoric and get to the issues. In midsummer 1970, when New York City jails erupted in riot, the rhetoric was as inflamed as the cell blocks. The jail called the Tombs was now called a concentration camp run, they said, by a court system prejudiced against the poor. If these people were white, or if they were rich, they would not be in that house of detention. They are 95% black poor people in those houses of detention. And they're only there because they cannot afford themselves of proper and adequate and efficient uh, legal representation. One of the rebellious prisoners was Alfred Kane, 23, a Vietnam War veteran. Brothers are too, far, too poor to be able to afford a lawyer to get legal aid. And legal aid, when they first come down to the bullpen, you know, when they first come down to the bullpen, to see the brothers, they don't even ask them whether or not they've guilty of the crime, they tell them what plea they can get there. They don't ask them what happened. They tell them, well, uh, I can get you uh, a year, I can get you three years, five years. Under indictment, but still legally innocent, Alfred Cain spent 16 months in the tombs waiting to get a lawyer who would argue his case, waiting out two trials, unable to make bail. Uh, bail, according to, to their law, is supposed to be not something to keep you in jail, not a ransom, but it's supposed to be the amount of money that you put up in order to uh, ensure the court that you will come back. But you have, say, as I said myself, my two comrades being held in $50,000 bail apiece. We don't have that kind of money, you see. What they do is, if they feel a person is going to fight a case, you see, they will take and keep him incarcerated for as long as time as possible. Those complaints are heard not just from New York's tombs, but wherever there are poor people accused of crimes. And in Alfred Kane's case, there was another factor besides being poor. He was a member of a still smaller minority, the radical group called the Black Panther Party. The case against Alfred Kane goes back to one morning in 1969. He and two friends, all members of a Brooklyn chapter of the Black Panthers, rode into Manhattan with a man named Wilbert Thomas, a more recent Panther recruit. It was Thomas's car, and he was driving up the west side towards Harlem. Just beyond the Harlem exit, they were stopped by a police car and arrested, accused of being on their way to this backstreet hotel, accused of planning to hold up the office with a sawed-off shotgun that was found in the car. Along with it, a diagram of the hotel. The gun and the diagram had been supplied by Wilbert Thomas, who turned out to be an undercover police agent. The state presented a long list of charges, including attempted robbery and attempted murder. But during Kane's 16 months in the tomb, some of those charges were dismissed by a judge for lack of evidence. When Kane went before the jury in July 1970, he stood accused of two kinds of crime. Crimes involving possession of illegal weapons, mainly the sawed-off shotgun. On these charges, Kane and his friends were found guilty. Crimes of conspiracy, the alleged robbery plot. The indictment said it was to get money for the Black Panthers. On all these more serious charges, the jury voted for acquittal. 
Alfred Kane, who had faced a possible 25 years in prison, was sentenced to five years probation. He is back on the street in his Brooklyn neighborhood, officially expelled from the Black Panthers as a detriment to the party, but still a believer in the radical cause and still bitter about the outcome of his trial. Well, I would not call it fair to be convicted of something that we didn't do. The prosecution did not try to convict us on the basis of the facts. What they tried to do was create a paranoia in the minds of the jury. They did not deal with the facts. What they said was these people are guilty because they're receiving funds from the People's Republic of China. Uh, the DA tried to, to have the jury believe that we were known cop killers. The, jury, the DA told the jury that, uh, you know, in general, what he was trying to do was tell them that they'd be purifying society by taking us off the streets for as long as possible. See, the jury, the jury, you have, you have a situation in which uh, juries are determined, the, the people on the jury are determined in a certain way. Number one, we cannot truly get a jury of our peers because we come from a community which is 100% uh, black and Puerto Rican. You know, now, we would never get a jury which is 100% black and Puerto Rican. We'll not get a pound to choose from. Now, uh, a white middle class person cannot possibly understand what is going on in the black community right now. They cannot understand the motivations of black people and why they do the things that they have to do in order to survive. So I can't see how a, a so-called white middle class person can even uh, rationalize to himself, him sitting in judgment of me. Do you feel the same way about a, a white defendant in regards to jury? That is, let's take a white person accused of raping a black woman. Do you think the jury should be all white? in that case? Well, uh, I don't know. Uh, I've never thought about that. Uh, no. What do you think would have happened if the jury had been all black and not middle class black? Then uh, we would have been uh, released. Just as, as simple as that. Right. This is what the jury finally decided about that aborted car trip to Harlem. Probably it was an act of conspiracy, part of a plan to rob the hotel. But it was the police agent's plan. Kane and his friends had been lured into it and trapped. And by New York law, entrapment required acquittal on those charges. About the weapons, there was an element of doubt. Kane himself never took the witness stand. But the jury decided he must have known they were in the car. So they convicted him of possession. This is a conviction that Kane protests and that his lawyer has appealed. Do you feel that you did nothing wrong at all? That's correct. Well, I did nothing wrong according to, to my point of reference. In the first place, uh, as far as weapons are concerned, we encourage black people to get weapons to defend themselves against the, against the racist violence that's committed against them in the society. We encourage this, and, and uh, it's not a thing where we're squeamish about the presence of weapons, because we're not. You know. And as I said, uh, well, I didn't say this before, but I was aware that one of the weapons was in the car. You know, I didn't feel as though that, uh, that because of this that I'd get, get as far away from that weapon as possible. You know, because I do heavily. We invited the prosecution to comment on the Alfred Kane case, but they declined as a matter of policy. We also invited comment from a second lawyer on the defense team, attorney Conrad Lynn. He talked with producer John Sharnick. I really felt that the middle class, white and black, particularly white people, would be so committed against the Panthers when they came to trial that there was no hope. But I was taught a lesson by that jury. Uh, that jury would not be swayed by the constant references of the prosecutor to the Mao book. Didn't they have the Mao book? The constant implication that communists were under every bed wherever they found these defendants. This, uh, the, the jury did not swallow this. Uh, the jury could not believe any of that about the conspiracies to rob banks, to, to commit murders, to wipe out policemen. The crime was constructed by the government. The government got the guns. The government bought the car. They, they, they admitted that. They, they got the car. There was a new car. The government's driver was this informant. He bugged the car. He drew the map of the scene of the crime. He determined where it was to be committed. The whole thing was a setup by the government, and the jury believed that. And they threw it out because of that. But should there not be some personal responsibility, and therefore some penalty, for joining in the plotting of a crime, uh, no matter whose idea it was, the police or anyone else's? We want our law enforcement agencies not to engage in ignoble enterprise. Therefore, 
some of the guilty will be permitted to escape in order to teach the law enforcement enterprises that this is not what they should be doing. As this was stated by Justice Holmes many years ago, and this is the guiding principle of any uh, civilized system of law. So the jury did a Solomon-like thing in this instance. They found him guilty of the possession of the guns. That was a responsibility they had. Even though they were led into this by the policemen, as men, uh, as young men, they should have known that the possession of guns under those circumstances were illegal. So the jury found them guilty of the possession of the weapons. Do you think they did a good Solomon-like thing or just simply a pragmatic Solomon-like thing? Well, I, I, my premise, my basic premise is that that the poor cannot get justice in this society. On behalf of the court administration, let me welcome all of you here to serve as jurors in this term of court. Now, Alfred Kane's jury was rather special in its racial makeup. And even in his case, where questions arose about the meaning of racial rhetoric, we could see the potential importance of a mixture of backgrounds among jurors. But the mixture is seldom a fair one. In big cities like New York and here in Philadelphia, names are picked from the broadest available source, the voter registration list. But they're not really picked at random. There's a weeding out process that emphasizes middle class occupations and middle class neighborhoods. In some cities, it's done not just on paper, but in person. What does your husband do? He's a clerk for Hall's Motors. Are you employed? Yes, I am. Uh, you're a secretary? Yes, for GE. How long have you been there? Three years. It will approve you for the second quarter. Is that right? Fine, it's April, you. May, or June. Mm -hmm. That's correct. In Philadelphia, as a result of this process, jury panels are said to have one-third more whites than their share of the city's population and one-third fewer blacks. To equalize the jury system will probably take citizens' lawsuits and acts of state legislatures. Another issue demanding reform is bail. The price of bail, which kept Alfred Kane in the tombs for 16 months, was too much for 80,000 other Americans by one recent count. That was the number of people waiting behind the bars of local jails, waiting for trial in our congested courts. Could you afford to post any bond, Mr. Banks? None, None whatsoever? What about your people, sir? Could they raise any money? They may be able to, I'm not sure. Bail reform is a nationwide movement. There is a similar project in New York. Under its provisions, Alfred Kane could not qualify for release without bond because the charges against him were felonies, serious crimes. But if he owned, say, a $50,000 house, he could have put the deed up his bond and been out of jail for those 16 months. There is something unfair about that in principle, as jurists from the Supreme Court on down have pointed out. But as long as crime threatens our streets, it seems hard to imagine any way to eliminate bail altogether without building in some protection for the community. The best protection for both the defendant and the public would be a speedy trial, and that our courts are now unable to provide. In the meantime, the bail issue, along with jury composition, remains an understandable cause for protest among the poor. In the meantime, also, there is a whole range of other issues having nothing to do with crime that affect the poor seeking justice in our courts. Please rise, Civil Division, Denver County Court, State of Colorado is now open for the transaction of any and all lawful business that may come before it. The Honorable Samuel M. Kirvins County Judge presiding. There are thousands of law-abiding citizens whose impressions of justice are shaped not by the courts that deal with crime, but the courts that deal with contracts and debts. Debts claimed by landlords, by credit merchants, and finance companies. These are the concerns of the civil court. Albert Rose and Len Millman doing business as Millrose Investment Company against Ralph G. Lane III. All right, you have personal service. You do have a verified complaint. Have you heard from the defendant at all since you... I have not, Your Honor. Here's the demand for pain. In these courts, the poor appear by the thousands, but in name only. Justice is a running dialogue between judges and creditors' attorneys. The poor are the absent minority. Defendant not appearing since you have personal service warrant well, default judgment for possession and one hundred one hundred and thirteen dollars and court costs. Okay. In seventy-five percent of these cases, judgment is by default. 
The creditor wins in the absence of anyone speaking for the debtor. No lawyer, not even the debtor himself. Anybody here know Paul Dorenzi? Okay, a default judgment for... Uh, hand the note to Miss Gibbs, please. For $500 plus costs. Where are the defendants? Some may simply be hiding from their creditors, but some are hiding from a system they cannot cope with a system of equal justice in which some are more equal than others. Judge J. Skelly Wright of the United States Court of Appeals, the nation's second highest tribunal. I think we must understand that uh, the law generally, as it relates to court proceedings involving the poor, is really biased against the poor. Now, the people who make these laws are basically middle-class people and traditionally have been so. They're not prejudiced against the poor, but they, to some degree, are ignorant of the needs of the poor and insen insensitive sometimes to his rights. The result is that when a creditor, a landlord, um, or a merchant of any kind brings a poor man into court, he, the poor man is faced with this vast body of law that really is slanted against him at the very beginning. More than this, the poor man comes into court alone. He comes into uh, these strange precincts, into this maze of, of law and technicality. He doesn't know which way to turn. He's as helpless as a child. And so, the fact is, the reality is, that he doesn't go at all. Uh, John R. Chase, last call on John R. Chase. <coughs> Notes canceled and default judgment for $500 plus cost. In many of these so-called small claims courts, not 75, but 95% of the judgments are by default. And often it's because the defendant is afraid to face the system or he doesn't understand how it works. Some people never uh, know that they're being sued until somebody comes to execute it, the judgment, that is, take their property or they find their wages garnished or whatever. That happens all too frequently. Attorney Edmund Fleming has practiced in Boston and Washington with legal services, an arm of the federal anti-poverty program. He explains the bias in the system, a built-in bias that favors the creditor. A defendant comes in having failed to pay on a, a conditional sales contract because a television set broke down and it was only a week old, and the seller refused to uh, fix it, which is not infrequent. As a matter of fact, it's uh, the most frequent occurrence. In that case, they believe they can uh, stop payment, uh, but they can't. The uh, seller has such a small burden of proof, such a little thing that he has to do, just showing that, in fact, a contract was signed and he, and he gets judgment. He gets in there quickly. Uh, he gets uh, the benefit of all the state's power on a minimum of proof, uh, proving only that the contract existed, proving only that uh, the payments weren't made, and all he does in order to establish that is say the payments were not made. Immediately, the uh, power of the state attaches on this, on this judgment, and he can go out and repossess the goods if he hasn't already. He can attach the wages. He can uh, <coughs> take whatever step he, he wants, and he has the sanction of, uh, of the state. Sold attorney on the red. $75, any more. This is one of the sanctions of the state against a man who owes money, selling his property at sheriff's auction on demand of the creditor. What's being sold here is mostly houses, people's homes, put on the block to satisfy a debt of as little as a few hundred dollars. Red number 92, $300 any more. Red number 83, $375 any more. The homeowner may get nothing out of this. The houses are usually sold for just enough to cover the claims, plus court costs and the fee for the creditor's lawyer. The machinery was designed to be run by lawyers, and it takes a lawyer to stop it. I could have gotten a lawyer, but where the money's going to come from to pay for a lawyer? Where the money going to pay for a lawyer? You need money for that kind of stuff. And I didn't have money. So you don't need to try to contact nobody without money. 
because I didn't have money. Mrs. Eloise Murchison paid about $8,000 for her house. It is listed to go on the block to settle a judgment of just about $330. That, she explained to reporter Bill Walker, was the unpaid balance of a bill on a carpet she bought, a balance claimed not by the carpet company, but a finance company. I bought rugs from the man. When I bought these rugs, the man caught charged me 400 and some dollars for the rugs. When they got the whole thing got added up, it was $525. I signed that slip for this. Then when they sent me another slip, they sent me a slip that I ordered them 700 and some dollars. As a result of this, did you stop making payments? No. I just kept on paying until I said I was going to get down to where I would have paid them $525. Then I was going to let him take me on into court with these papers. But you never got to court. I never got there. They never consult me about it. They just keep sending me out these uh, things from the shelf sale. Mrs. Murchison, if you had a chance to tell your story to a judge, what would you have told him? I would have asked the judge, do he think that was a fair deal that the man did to me when he sent me another slip out there charging me 700 and some dollars, which and then I didn't sign for him. I really think I should have had opportunity to tell them. Maybe it would have helped some. That's the way I feel. This is the way I work hard and labor and scuffle and got money and pay for this house and I'm not moving out of here. I'm not moving. What the debtor is up against here demonstrates the special problems of the poor man under our system of civil justice. He is faced with speedy and drastic action on behalf of the creditor, and he seldom gets to tell his side of the story, right or wrong, before things start to happen, because he can't afford the lawyer who might be able to stave off the action of the court. This is what Mrs. Murchison was up against until she told her story at her neighborhood legal services office told it free of charge to attorney Joel Weisberg. Now, they say that the sheriff brought to your home this paper, which is supposed to be your notice that they were going to start suing you and you could go to court. Did you ever see this paper before? I never saw these papers before. You never received those? Not this paper I never received. Let me explain some of what happened to you, and it, it, it might help you understand some things. What they've done is, they have taken the $525, added interest here, and made it up to $650-some dollars. They've then, in addition to that, added insurance, which they didn't tell you about, and compounded it all together until the total came to $722. Mrs. Murchison, what, what's happened here is not uncommon. Uh, it happens to, to many people. These, Merchants come around to your home, state one price, give you a contract, and then go to sell that contract and state it at another price. And I can assure you that we're not going to let your home be sold, and that we're not going to let this end with you having to pay $722. You've signed, clearly, something for $525. And I think that's all you should have to pay, and not the rest of this. The home will not be sold. We'll see to that. Well, thank you. Represented by legal services, Mrs. Murchison did not lose her house, nor did she lose those extra payments claimed by the finance company. What happens in a situation like this is, uh, she entered into a contract with a carpet company. Uh, however, the carpet company, and this is typical, does not retain the contract. They pass it on to someone else, to a finance company or to a bank, and the payments are made there. Buyer can say, the carpet just fell apart, I don't want to pay anymore. Uh, well, the fact that it fell apart is a defense against the seller, but it's not against the finance company or bank that you have to pay, because they say all we bought was the note, all we bought was the bill. Uh, we didn't buy the rest of it. If you say you only contracted for $525, not $700 plus, go fight that out with a carpet company. I'm not concerned. Mrs. Murchison told us she had never received a notice a complaint had been filed against her. Is that possible? I have here a typical complaint, and you can see by looking at the back of it 
but it's full of all kinds of notices, uh, most of which are very unimportant to the individual receiving it. Now, if the individual takes this and reads it carefully and reads every word and understands every word in here, he still will not know what he's supposed to do with it because there's nothing in the complaint that tells him what he's supposed to do. The only information is lost here in the back. No summons to appear in court accompanies this? No summons under Pennsylvania pleading. This is all that you will receive. This will be handed by the sheriff and this alone and nothing further. Mr. Weisberg, the people who use uh, this, the sale of a person's home at sheriff's auction are working within the system. Why can't the person who feels he has been wrong find some redress of his grievance through the legal system? The problem is that basically the system he started out against them. Uh, the, the courts are used to providing service for the creditor, not the debtor. Uh, any service for the debtor is a new thing. Um, they could never afford counsel. And even when we're not talking about the, the very poor, even when we're talking about someone who theoretically could hire a lawyer, uh, when they've lost three or four hundred dollars in a transaction and it's going to cost them five or six to get a lawyer to get it back, uh, they're just going to forget about it. So it was only the creditor who had a lawyer. It was only the creditor who went in the court. It was not until legal services programs started just four or five years ago uh, that lawyers were made available for the debtor as well. All right, Mr. Alvarez, do you have any questions about what you can do here today or the procedures here? No. All right, do you know whether you want to admit or deny this claim against you? Oh, I, uh, Your Honor, uh, you represent Mr. Alvarez. I spoke to the Alvarez's outside, and I think this is a case that uh, legal aid can handle. And I think leave to uh, file an answer should be given, and I've uh, informed the Alvarez's that they can go to our downtown office and get legal aid. In Denver, Colorado, under the title of legal aid, there are lawyers for the poor on call at all times in the civil courts. Some argue that this is a right, as basic as a right to an attorney in a criminal case. If you have a right to counsel when you're liable to lose some liberty, I think you also and equally have a right to counsel when you're liable to be tossed out, when you're liable to have everything you own taken away from you. Uh, I don't think a person is any worse off when he's sent to prison for a year than when he's confined to the street because he has no home because his creditor has taken it away. I think he deserves representation there as well. He deserves a right. Legal Services is that controversial branch of OEO, the Federal Anti-Poverty Agency. For the whole five years of its existence, it has been criticized as politically motivated, threatened with local restrictions and with loss of federal funds. But in the meantime, it not only gives the poor a voice in court, it is also part of an effort to reform the system itself, to make equal justice really equal. Even at the nation's source of law in Washington, D.C., the legal system sometimes bears down with unequal weight. Until legal services arrived on the scene, it bore down on the tenants of an apartment building called Clifton Terrace. Well, when I first moved into Clifton Terrace, it was a beautiful place. We had a uh, beautiful hedge all around the outside, the beautiful grass, the driveway was beautiful, and the apartment was very, very nice. After uh, several, well, I don't know whether I was in here quite a year before uh, they changed hands. Then things began to happen. We had no heat, no hot water, and the rats, the roaches started to take over. We couldn't even get an exterminator in. Our electrical fires were breaking out all over because of we using electric heat, you know, heaters. And uh, we found 18 cases of meningitis and TBs from burning the stoves, you know, that yellow flame. And the little kids had carried them out of here. And it seems that license inspection never wanted anything done about it. So they would come in and hold up a little thermometer and say, you have ample heat. This was the Department of Licenses and Inspections, yeah. which is supposed to enforce the housing enforce regulations. Enforce the housing regulations. And we never could get anything done about it. What can a tenant do in a case like that? 
either pay rent or move. That was a choice the law provided, no matter that the place was decaying around them, no matter that the housing code remained unenforced. It was ancient common law handed down from the age of country squires and tenant farmers when the tenant cut his own firewood, thatched his own roof, and paid his rent, or the landlord could simply evict him. Attorney Edmund Fleming of Legal Services happened to run a neighborhood office right in the basement of Clifton Terrace. He decided to challenge the law in the local courts. To vigorously fight a landlord-tenant action with complicated theories of law is little more than, a, than a just distressing to a judge because he doesn't want to listen to all that nonsense. After all, this is only, uh, you know, arguing about $150. What's $150? So what? You can always move into another apartment, you know. You don't have to stay in this place. So they tend to dismiss the uh, importance of it. The judge would shout, have you paid the rent? Normally the reply was, no, I haven't paid the rent, but he hasn't repaired the thing and he told me he was going to repair it. When can you pay the rent? I can't pay the rent. And then the, the judge would turn to wh whatever lawyer was there representing the landlord saying, do you want to give him any more time? And the, uh, uh, the lawyer would generally say, uh, we've been through this before, we don't want to give him any more time. Or would say, give him three days, give him five days. And the judgment would be entered along those lines. Now that was a long case. Now, that would take, uh, what, 35 seconds. That was the general uh, activity in that court. So the point is, first the law failed, and then the courts failed. For almost four years, Fleming kept going to court arguing his case. It became known as a Javins case, the name of one of the tenants, and Fleming took it all the way up to the Federal Court of Appeals. In May 1970, in an opinion written by Judge J. Skelly Wright, that court reversed centuries of precedent. The Javins case holds that when a landlord leases property, he warrants that he will keep this property in livable condition, uh, pursuant to the law. That in each contract of lease is read the housing code. And uh, by contract, the landlord must comply with the housing code. And if the, he does not, since the landlord is not living up to his bargain, that is keeping the property up, then the tenant ought not to be required to live up to his full bargain, paying the full rent. Uh, he should be allowed a diminution of the rent because of the condition of the premises. That's what Javins held. And it would seem to me that uh, any layman would understand Javins and think it was completely reasonable why it took a court uh, something like 500 years to change the old common law so as to bring it up to date uh, gives an indication of the kind of uh, thing we've been talking about, this massive body of common law that's been built up that has to be changed and how hard it is to change it. The court's decision is law in the Washington area. There, the impact of the Javins case can be seen in some places, and Clifton Terrace itself is one of them. The housing violations corrected, the property restored, although only after a government agency took over and became the landlord. But in all but two or three states, the courts still follow the old tenant-farmer formula, pay the rent or move out. In every state, a merchant can still repossess goods without a court hearing. In 47 states, a finance company can still collect on a television set, even though the set does not work. The federal government is now trying to outlaw that practice. There are so many laws that now are on the books that, are, that work a real hardship that I would start by uh, revising them. I would start, you know, I could probably name you uh, by going through any code a hundred laws that work uh, a seriously bad effect on, on poor people, uh, or on people generally. Uh, beyond that, I think I would uh, undertake a drastic revision in the court system. The selection process, although that's the most difficult, trying to devise a system to select sensitive, intelligent men to be judges, uh, is uh, probably not entirely possible. Uh, I would certainly uh, increase the, uh, the facilities that are available to them. 
uh, by fivefold at least, put that many more judges in, in the courts. Well, Judge Wright, how do you go about changing all this? You've got this mountain of law built up over generations that works against poor people. Where do you begin? The first step would seem to me in uh, eliminating some of the injustice that results in these kinds of cases is by providing a lawyer. Now, I realize that uh, this is a, a large an undertaking, perhaps a significantly larger undertaking than providing lawyers in criminal cases. But uh, this is being done uh, in every federal court in the country now, in many state courts in the country now, in criminal cases. And uh, something of the same kind uh, can be uh, tried, at least on a pilot basis, uh, in the civil courts. Uh, the question is whether or not uh, uh, society wants to spend the time and the money to do justice in these kinds of cases. I happen to be of the view that it's worth the money, it's worth the time. Uh, it's worth it not only uh, from the standpoint of, of morality, but in society's own self-interest. Until we take this first step, until we make some effort to provide representation for a, a poor man that claims... About 25 million Americans are officially categorized as poor. If they have any last resort, it should be the courts. Yet it's the judicial system that they trust the least that bewilders and costs them the most. We make no argument that the poor are superior to others in virtue, as so much rhetorical sociology implies, or that the judges are deficient in virtue. Like Judge Wright of the Federal Appeals Court, we argue that the machinery of justice has loosened with age. Its wheels are turning on a bias. The small claims courts were originally set up to serve the ordinary citizen. But in the words of the staff report to a presidential commission, those courts have become collection agencies for merchants and finance companies. In one large city, until two years ago, there were courts that did not even keep a printed form to record a judgment in favor of the defendant. Any of us, poor or not, who buys a faulty household appliance or wants to dispute a bill is potentially at the mercy of this bias. But the poor are the least equipped to fight it. The American Bar Association says it would take upwards of $400 million a year to provide free legal counsel to people who need it in civil cases. We actually spend less than a tenth of that. As this hour has shown you, there are good people working to balance the tilt in the system, people in legal services on the bench and legislatures and government agencies, but it is still hard shoving. As for the system of criminal justice, there are people at work there too, conscientious people in jury rooms and at bail reform projects, trying to balance that principle of equal justice against the dangers of crime in the streets. What makes that balance so hard to maintain is the congestion in our courts. This is a subject we'll address ourselves to in the next report on justice in America. This is Eric Severide. Now this is very important and I must, I cannot stress it too much. Once you've been assigned to a case, you are not allowed to discuss that case with anyone. Even when you go home at night, do not discuss it with your wife nor with your husband. Nothing that is presently before the case before the court is allowed to be discussed for fear that something that you might say or someone else might say to you could prejudice the whole matter and result in a mistrial. Now, I'm telling you now, and you'll be told again in the courtroom. Now, let me go into another aspect of jury service. In first-degree murder cases, it's necessary to lock the jurors up until the case has been adjudicated. But since the word locking up carries a certain connotation, we no longer say lock up, we say sequestered. We say you are sequestered jurors.